How do batteries work? Well, that's what we'll go over in this video, explaining the chemistry behind them and why they do the things they do. But first, let's start by quickly taking a gander at the reaction. And that reaction is this. So basically, we take some zinc, react it with manganese dioxide and water, and in return, we get zinc oxide with two manganese oxyhydroxides. Neat. But how does that generate electricity? Well, to answer that question, we'll need some background knowledge. And now to get that background knowledge, we'll have to first start by answering the question of what is oxidation? Well, that's simple. Oxidation is just the increase of the oxidation state. Now, what is the oxidation state? Well, oxidation state is the value telling us how a molecule would behave in a redox reaction. Now, what is a redox reaction? Well, a redox reaction is a reaction composed of two half reactions, the oxidation and the reduction. What is the reduction? The reduction is the reduction of the oxidation state. But what does that? Well, that usually means that something is gaining electrons. Why is that important? Okay, I'll stop this a bit because it's getting quite annoying. And so that is where we'll start our electric journey, by talking about redox. So, first as a starter, this paragraph from Libertex with The definition of oxidation states predates our ability to estimate electron densities through quantum mechanical calculations. And also, especially, it is a serious mistake to think that the oxidation state system provides a quantitative description of actual electron densities. Which is just a great line in my opinion. But the basic idea is simple. Oxidation states tell you how should an element behave in a bond. So basically, how many electrons would they gain slash lose if a specific bond was broken. What broken actually means here is the ionic approximation, which all right, okay, slight tangent. Inside our molecules, atoms can be bonded in two ways, using charge or using quantum mechanics. If they are bonded using charge, that's simple enough. You have an ion that's positively charged and you have an ion that's negatively charged and, you know, opposite charges attract, simple as it could be. Them being bonded using quantum mechanics, however, is a whole different story and a good example of that would be covalent bonding. You see, in covalent bonding, atoms aren't being held together by their charges. That's because atoms are neutral. So instead, they are being held together by the electrons. The reasoning there being that electrons have certain discrete shapes that they can take on. And when two atoms come together, then this shape is lower in energy than this shape. And this shape right here brings them together. There we go. That's the quick overview, in the future I'll make another video explaining it all more in depth using quantum mechanics, but for now I have this video on the channel explaining it good enough. And with that in mind, let's look at water. In water we've got oxygen and two hydrogens bonded like so. On the right we have the hydrogen and oxygen bonded with two electrons between them, and on the left we have hydrogen and oxygen bonded with two electrons between them. Now, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, which basically translates to it pulling on electrons harder, which means that these electrons are actually closer to the oxygen than to hydrogen. And so if we ignore the bonds for a second and just using the power of our imagination pretend that they're all just ions, then oxygen would have two more negative charges and hydrogens would lose a negative charge each, resulting in a more positive charge. So just to repeat, these would be the atoms on their own, then after they bond, and here's how the fact that they're in our molecule brings them closer to the oxygen. Next, let's move on to something a tad more interesting, that is potassium hydroxide. Here's the molecule, and now, what are the oxidation states? Well, once again, potassium is bonded with oxygen, and oxygen with hydrogen. So once again, we have them in bonds, and we have the electrons that make them up. Now, oxygen is once again winning with electronegativity, pulling the electrons away from hydrogen and away from potassium, resulting in plus one, minus two, plus one. That's because this is how the electrons move, and this moving away leads to a more positive charge and these moving in leads to a more negative charge. So there we go. Next, let's move on to something larger to truly test our skills, something like urea. 
This molecule is a fair bit larger and it's an organic molecule, that's because it has a carbon chain. You know, because anything that contains any carbon is legally a carbon chain. <laughs> okay, so all of these are bonded normally and right here I'll set the brightness of every single atom to represent its electronegativity. Meaning that oxygen is the highest so it will pull the electrons away from carbon. Nitrogens also pull them away from carbon and hydrogens, resulting in hydrogens getting plus one, nitrogens getting a minus three, carbon getting plus three, and oxygen minus one. Correct? Wrong! That's because between our carbon and oxygen, we actually have a double bond, meaning that oxygen isn't pulling away two electrons, only four, which means that it's getting two more than it would normally have so minus two charge, and carbon is losing four more than it would normally have, so plus four charge, and those are the oxidation states. And I would love to give you more examples, but to be completely honest, water, potassium, hydroxide, and urea were just kind of easy, and all the other chemicals running around my office are like salts, and salts are bonded ionically, so, you know, the bonds are already ionic, so if you do an ionic approximation of an ionic bond, then it's not really an approximation. <laughs> so just to reiterate once more, to really make sure you understand, what we do is we take our molecules, which are bonded together. In most cases, in a bond like this, the electrons won't be exactly in the middle and will instead get pulled towards the atom with the highest electronegativity. So in order to determine the oxidation state, we just freeze the electrons where they are, and then using the powers of our schizophrenia, we pretend that they are bonded with charge instead of quantum mechanics. And there we go. The charge tells us the oxidation state. But here's where we get to the honestly quite frustrating part, because in school, back when you were learning about oxidation states, then the way you were probably introduced to them was with rules like these. I myself wanted to skip redox reactions for this video entirely for that specific reason, and I would have if it wasn't for one especially handsome frog who explained this to me. But now, with that context, you can see why these rules exist. So for example, if you have a molecule with identical atoms, their oxidation state is zero, which makes sense. The same atoms have the same electronegativity, which means the electrons are always in the middle. Another rule could be that fluorine has the oxidation state of negative one. Why? Well, it's because it's the most electronegative, and it usually can only bond with a single covalent bond. So it will always take an electron closer to itself, but can only take one. Yet another rule could be the oxygen, which has a negative two. Unless it's bonded with fluorine or oxygen. Why? Well, it's because oxygen is electronegative enough to take electrons from any atom except fluorine or another oxygen. That's why normally it would have negative two, it bonds twice and steals both electrons, unless another oxygen puts up as good of a fight or fluorine steals it back. And so that's the reasoning for oxidation states. And so with that background, you can look back at our battery, first starting with manganese dioxide, water, and an electron. Here's how the bonds fall between them. Lovely. Basically, first we have water, where oxygen has two electrons at its disposal to bond with, and hydrogen has only one. Then in manganese dioxide, oxygens also have two, but manganese has a whopping five, which means that when manganese dioxide bonds to the oxygens, they bond with a double bond, like so. And manganese has one electron left over. Then on the other side, the water, which we've talked about already, and then finally, just an electron. Chilling. And so what happens in this case is we take our electron, force it into water, and what we get is a negative hydroxide ion and a hydrogen. Then this hydrogen atom moves over to bond with the oxygen on the manganese, and there we have it, manganese oxyhydroxide. Now, why is this reaction important? Well, it's because we start with our standard reactants, and using an electron, we turn them into this molecule and this ion. Now, the molecule itself is really not that important, but the ion is. That's because this ion will be the only thing that can pass the barrier of an electrolyte. So basically, we've got a barrier of ions, most likely hydroxide ions, where if you push a hydroxide into it, a hydroxide pops on the other side. 
that's that's honestly kind of it. The crucial foreshadowing here being that you can push a hydroxide and it works, but if you push an electron, it doesn't, despite both of them having negative charge. This will be important later. But then that hydroxide on the other side is met with zinc, which accepts those hydroxides to form a zincate ion and release two electrons. And here's where you can notice something curious. If we balance it out properly, we put four electrons in, turn them into four hydroxides, and get back two electrons in return. How could that be useful? We're losing electrons. We're supposed to be generating electricity, not losing electrons. How could that be? Well, in order to understand that, allow me to switch up this setup a bit. There we go. Now I'm going to set up these bars at the bottom, which will represent how much of each chemical we have. So first we start by adding our electrons, which react with manganese dioxide and water to form manganese oxyhydroxide and hydroxide ions. Then those ions end up on the other side, where they react with zinc to form zincate. And then out we get half an electron. Now, this reaction continues, but don't worry, there is more. For example, zinc eventually can bond with two hydroxides to release two electrons, and then it can further break down into zinc oxide and water, which makes it a tad more intricate. And this will once again be important later, but then finally, the last thing to mention is the fact that there are other let's just call them undesirable chemicals that can form, and over the course of using our battery, more and more of them accumulate. These are just the chemicals that aren't quite as easy to break down back to get useful hydroxides, ions or electrons. And here's where we finally reach the end, because, you see, this entire video I've just been explaining the chemistry, but those specific parts of chemistry I've put in this video are actually there to explain some actual qualities that batteries have. So let's review for a bit. First of all, our total reaction takes in electrons and outputs electrons, but our net is still zero electrons, so how are we generating electricity? Well, we are generating electricity because electricity isn't really the electrons, it's the movement of electrons. We'll get into it more next video, but the basic idea is that using our battery to store electrons is, well, Let's just call it difficult, and as such, it's much easier to achieve electron flow that's going out of our battery and then back into our battery. And we achieve that because of the thing number two, the electrolyte. You see, we actually have electrons and hydroxide ions on both sides for the taking, but the way they're connected means that hydroxide can only pass through this and electrons can only pass through this, which means that if you just leave the battery on its own, the reaction can't continue. The right side builds up electrons, and since the left side doesn't have enough electrons, it can't generate any more hydroxides, and our general reaction would stop. And so that's why you need the wire to decharge it, and why you need a complete circuit in order for the electricity to flow. If you don't complete the circuit, you'll either lack hydroxides or the electrons. Another thing is the fact that there isn't really just a single reaction going on. You make manganese oxyhydroxide, manganese oxide, zincate with different hydroxides, zinc oxides, and all of these happen at different voltages, different concentrations, different times. And so that's why the voltage of a battery can actually vary, depending on the circumstance. Another thing would be the undesirable chemicals, which accumulate over time and are really hard to break down. You see, in a perfect world, a battery could actually last forever. You could decharge it, recharge it, and use it so on and so forth. But we don't actually live in a perfect world, and that's why batteries degrade over time. Meaning that if you use up a battery too much, you might actually not be able to charge it back up completely. And there could be more I could mention, the recharging, the crystal structure, the volume expansion, the practical voltages, but my goodness, it's been two weeks since the last video was gone. Well, that was a bit of an odd video, wasn't it? Like, for example, the entire first segment about oxidation states, which never got mentioned anywhere else in the video, that was surely quite odd. But with that in mind, I hope you understand how a battery works now. And that will be the purpose of this series, because there will be a series of videos in which I explain every single electrical component in depth. In enough depth so that you understand why certain things happen and not just 
know that they do happen. But yeah, it was a bit of an odd video, mainly because a lot of things came together, long story, blah, blah, no one cares about my private life. Anyway, thank you so much to my beloved patrons, especially thanks to Acronymous, Useless, Kwanza and Tefta for supporting me with the highest patrons of the year. I love you all so much, without you I wouldn't be able to make these sorts of videos. And I would really recommend you get a Patreon, normally I don't chill for it like that, but uh, recently I'm switching more and more to practical videos like this or this, or this, and they do get expensive. So I, I kind of need the money for videos, to be honest. I also have a Discord server and I stream a series of live streams called Charity Checkout, which we stream for charity. Right now we're collecting money for Charity Prevent Cancer Foundation. Would recommend, it's lots of fun. And I do a bunch of these practical things on those live streams. Here's a clip. And so basically, uh, basically, basically, We'll have a single, oh, I lost the LED. Oh no, never mind, there it is. We'll have a single LED, right? We're gonna prop it on one side, like so. Then uh, we're going to have some buttons. Okay, here I have a button. We're gonna add a button on the other side. Let me just make sure that... Uh... Anyway, for now, that'll be it. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye. No, you're in jail. You're, you're in jail. You're in jail. You cannot behave yourself. You cannot behave yourself at the moment. So you're just gonna stay here on my lap. Got it? No, you haven't. You, <laughs> you haven't been a single lesson, have you? Absolutely no thoughts. Head empty. Well, that's great. <laughs>